الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فخذوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر ثم أتم الصيام إلى الليل سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم So we've been discovering or discussing some of the aspects of the fiqh of fasting and we're going to continue now remember that the definition of fasting is that we abstain from food drink and uh, from food drink and intercourse from dawn meaning from the beginning of fajr all the way until the uh, time of maghrib and that we do so with an intention so really the act consists of abstinence from a set of things during a specific time with an intention to do so so when these three things are um, performed together then that results in a fast Now we already spoke about who fasting is mandated upon, who are the exempted people, etc. But now we need to discuss the timing of the fast. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually addresses this issue within his book in the ayah that I just recited. فَقُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا So go ahead and eat and drink. حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْطُ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجَرِ uh, All the way until the Uh, white thread and the black thread are dist- distinguished from one another. Meaning, go ahead and eat and drink all the way until um, day and night become distinct from one another. Which is basically, this refers to the beginning of the time of Fajr. Uh, and then go ahead and complete the fast all the way until the night. Which basically means all the way until the time of Maghrib. Now, it's pretty straightforward the way it's mentioned in the Qur'an exactly what needs to be done, but there's one issue that I want to touch upon. Um, so first of all, again, the fast begins from the beginning of dawn all the way until the uh, time of Maghrib. <coughs> the time of Maghrib is defined as, well, let's start with the dawn. Right? The beginning of Fajr is defined as that time when the light of the sun begins to span across the horizon. And the end of the fast, which is the time of Maghrib, is defined as when the upper pole of the sun goes beneath the horizon. So remember, like, let's say you're looking at this, this is the horizon. Right, so this, this is this, let's just say this is the ground here. This flat thing, plane is the horizon. So if the sun, let's the sun is rising, the sun comes from underneath, right, and then it rises. So when it's coming from underneath, When it's uh, beneath the horizon, when it comes to a certain point beneath the horizon, its light begins to shine across the horizon, much before the sun actually rises. Um, and that's actually the beginning of Fajr, when that light shines across the horizon. Then what happens is the sun continues to rise, continues to rise, continues to rise, until its upper pole crosses the horizon. That's the end of Fajr. Then the sun rises, 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 until it reaches the peak in the sky, which is right before Zohar. And then it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going on this side, right? And it's going to um, set in the west. And when the upper pole of the sun goes underneath the horizon, meaning the upper tip of the sun goes underneath the horizon, that's the time of Mahomet. So the fasting goes all the way from the uh, beginning of Fajr all the way until the sun disappears from Mahomet. The only discussion here is the <coughs> issue of when Fajr actually, actually begins. And it actually is somewhat of a discussion, so I want to spend a couple minutes uh, talking about it. Now go back to the concept. Here's the ground. This is the horizon, this whole flat plane here. And my fist is the sun. Now initially, the sun is coming from back here. And there's, there's, there's no light anywhere across the horizon. So that's still night. Then the sun keeps right, keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming. And then eventually what happens is as the sun gets to be near the horizon, then its light begins to shine across the horizon. And that's the beginning time of Fajr. Now initially during the lifetime of the Prophet them, the way they would determine the beginning of Fajr is they would just look. I mean, they didn't have clocks. They didn't have prayer timetables. So there was no other way of doing it. 
they would look across the horizon, and when they would see the sun lights, the thin, thin light, very, very, very beginning light, it was just a thin strip of light. That thin strip of light would span the horizon, and they would go ahead and call the Adhan. That would be the beginning of Fajr, and the fast would begin. Now, all of this is in a very um, routine manner, the way the sun rises and sets and rises and sets, and actually you can calculate it. If you know astronomy and you know some rules of how the sun works, eventually, uh, eventually the Muslims learned how to calculate this. So eventually clocks were developed and the Muslims began to discover certain aspects of astronomy and they found that they could calculate this. Now, what they did when they were calculating this is they said one way to determine or to come up with a standard method is to say how many degrees beneath the horizon does the sun have to be for that white light to shoot across the horizon? Right, so if this is the horizon, right? And the sun is coming from underneath. How many degrees from beneath the horizon? How many degrees, right, that's the angle. There's an angle there. How many degrees beneath the horizon does the sun have to be before the light of further spans across the, sun, uh, across the horizon? So our astronomers, along with our scholars, both of them were very well versed at looking at the sun because they had been doing this every single day. I mean, this is what the Bedouins did every single day. People were very well trained in it. They, they were very experienced in it. They found that... Is there a car blocking? Yeah. Okay, Lexus B719125, Nissan Sentra XCD80. Two cars, Lexus B719125, Nissan Sentra XCD80. Anyway, so what they found was that when the sun was 18 degrees beneath the horizon, that that white light was spanned across the horizon. And so our astronomers, along with our scholars, determined that the beginning of Fajr can be calculated at 18 degrees. And uh, all the way up until now, there is no um, refutation of those calculations. The, the, the uh, formulas that they used to calculate were correct, and, um, and similarly, the observations that the people had made were correct. Okay, so that's been the history of the Islamic um, community all the way up until recently. Now, mind you that astronomers all over the Islamic world, in the subcontinent, in the Arab world, in Africa, they all agreed on this point. Both the astronomers as well as the scholars that it, at least 18, some said 19, some said 20, meaning they made it earlier, right? The, the larger the number, the further the sun is depressed, the earlier the time for pleasure is going to be. Then what happened was in 1970, approximately, somewhere around there, I'm not very good at this, this history, but around in the 1970s, there was a war between India and Pakistan. And when there was this war between India and Pakistan, Pakistan ended up blacking out their cities so that if the Indian jets came to bomb, they wouldn't be able to hit, pick their targets out very well. Now when they blacked out their city, then one of the scholars in Pakistan said, wow, this is a great opportunity. I mean, you see where their mind goes, subhanAllah, where they think. There's a war going on, people are blacking out the city so that they don't get bombed. And he starts thinking, wow, this is the first time where there's no light coming from the city. So I could actually go and watch the sunrise and see when does that white light span across the horizon. It's similar to do so. This is the way you're supposed to determine it. So let me go and see. So what he did was he went and he, the first day, this lasted for three or four days, this little blackout thing. Anyway, the first day he went and he started looking and he found that the time that the white spanned across the horizon was at 15 degrees. If you calculated, if you back calculated, it was when the sun was 15, not 18, which means it was 15 minutes later, approximately. 15 or 20 minutes later than the 18 degree timetable. So the first day he did that and he was shocked because here all of Pakistan has been doing 18 degrees. In fact, I think they were doing, well, they were doing 18 at that time. So then he said, well, this is one person, so let me call all the scholars. And he called all the big scholars of Karachi, even Mufti Muhammad Shafi, Mufti Shafi Ismani Sahib's father. He even called Mufti Muhammad Shafi. They all went together the next day. So the next ch opportunity that they had, they all went together, and they all looked. And as they were looking, there were just a handful of them, maybe four or five, as they were looking, they again saw <clears throat> that at about 15 degrees, the white came across the horizon. 
So then they all got together and they said, now, we've all seen this, and we really can't refute one another because we all agree, so we need to write a fatwa. We need to write a fatwa that actually fajr does not begin at 18 degrees, it begins at 15 degrees. So they wrote a fatwa. They published that fatwa, and when they wrote that fatwa and published that fatwa, and actually I think word got out much earlier that they were going to do this, the astronomers and the scientists and other people in Pakistan began to say, how can you do this? You have to think about what you're doing. The whole Muslim world uses 18 degrees or 19 degrees. And now you want to make pleasure time, the beginning of pleasure time later, and make it at a 15 degree, uh, at 15 degrees. So then they started thinking that, you know, we don't really have much experience in this. And we, this is, you have, this is something that you need to do regularly. You can't just make on one single sighting. So then they all did, they put out the fatwa. There was uh, a backlash against it. And they all did rujua of that fatwa. They all actually turned back and said, we take back the fatwa, we were mistaken. Anyway, the one scholar who actually made that observation the first day, he said, well, no, I still believe what I saw. And so therefore, I'm, my fatwa is 15. And he was a very respected mufti, so people have accepted his fatwa as well. Now, then what happened is in 1980, 79, 80, whenever ISNA started, MSA and ISNA and all these organizations in the States, when they started, then they started looking into the issue because they wanted to come up with a timetable for the United States. When they wanted to come up with a timetable for the United States, they looked into the issue to find out who had written about it, and obviously the most vocal person about it, the most per- one who had written the most about it, was the first Mufti who had had the idea when the black god that looks, look, whether, there's, whether it's 15 or 18 or what it is. So they saw that, and they decided that, they saw his ruling, and they took his ruling of 15 degrees. Right, so the reason why you need to understand this is because if you look at the timetables in Chicago, there's always two. There's one timetable that be, that says the fast, maybe today's fast begins at, I don't know, what what was it on this timetable here today? 5.05, and the other one probably said 5.40, 5.50, right? Or so, no, 5.05, and the other one said 4.50 probably. So there's a 5.05 and there's a 4.50. The 4.50 is 18 degrees, and the 5.05, the later one, is 15 degrees. So anyway, when ISNA was coming up with this whole thing, they obviously just looked into it, and the one person who was most vocal about it, um, and they were able to get individual fatwa from him at that time, so they went ahead and they got this fatwa for 15, so they took that fatwa for 15. Now, what you have to understand is that in this particular issue, the whole Islamic world literally follows 18 degrees for the majority of Islamic history that we know. For every, everything in Islamic history that we know, that's what it is. For example, the University of Karachi, with the exception of the one masjid of that Murphy, the University of Karachi follows 18 degrees. The University of Karachi covers the jurisdiction of Pakistan, India, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. So these four countries, they follow 18 degrees. And that's number one. Number two, the Muslim World League, their ruling is 18 degrees. So all of Europe, and all of the Far East, all follows 18 degrees. Umul Qura, in the Arabian Peninsula, right, Mecca, Medina, Munawwara, uh, all of the Arabian Peninsula, Kuwait, etc., all of them follow Umul Qura. Umul Qura's ruling is 19 degrees, so even earlier. And then the Egyptian General Authority, which is the third sort of group of people that's involved in this issue, they actually don't say 18 or 19, they say 19.5. So it's even earlier, right? And this includes and covers the following countries, Africa, Malaysia, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. So now basically you tell me the entire Muslim world, for the, entire, for the vast majority, in fact, well, for, as far as we know, for the entire history of the Muslim world, has, has at least 18 degrees. The only exception is the good United States of America. Right? We're the only exception. Actually, we're not the only exception because half of America follows 15, the ISNA timetable, and then the other half, which tends to follow the more traditional scholars, follows 18. So if you look in Chicago, you're going to find two timetables. But basically, the safety is in 18. Because you have to remember one principle, and that is we are Ahl-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. Right? 
And it's very, it's a very important thing to keep in mind that we are the people of the Sunnah wal Jama'ah. We follow the Jama'ah. So when you consider what does the Jama'ah, when you have this kind of issue where the entire Muslim nation follows 18 degrees, and there's one country, which right, which is not even a Muslim country, it's a minority. They they have probably you know what we have two or three million million Muslims in the states, not more. So when you actually look at it, I mean we're like a, we're like 0.001 percent of the entire Muslim population, right? So in that particular case, they don't, it's not, it doesn't behoove us to take that minority exemption. If there's one scholar, and then you have thousands upon thousands of scholars, the safety doesn't lie in following the one scholar. The safety lies in, in following the thousands upon thousands of scholars. That's what we mean by Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. We follow the majority. So in this particular case, I really encourage each of you that you use the 18 degree timetable. And actually, this must have used the 15 degree timetable, and I'll, I'll tell you, I don't agree with that timetable. Because it's just not safe. I can understand where the ruling comes from, and if somebody wants to follow it, I'm not going to argue with it, because they do have the backing of a single mufti, which is sufficient. Once you have that, that is sufficient. He's a true mufti, he understood the issue, he took other scholars there in order to, to confirm the issue, he understands his fit, he's an extremely respected mufti. So in that particular instance, you can't really ar argue. But it just doesn't make sense when you're dealing with such an essential issue, like your fasting. I mean, this is like one of the key things that defines who we are. We, we, we rely so much upon it in order to purify ourselves during this blessed month. So why not be safe and take start 15 minutes earlier? It's just 15 minutes. You know, we're not talking about two hours. We're talking about just waking up 10 or 15 minutes earlier and starting your fast a bit earlier. Now, um, also keep in mind that if there is a masjid that has 15 degrees, it behooves the people who run that masjid, if they follow 15 degrees, to write on their timetable the actual issue. And say, say, asterisk, we calculated this at 15 degrees. However, the vast majority of the Muslim world, in fact, every single country in the Muslim world, uses 18 degrees. It, it, it is safer to use that time, so if possible, please end your fast 15 minutes earlier than what's on the timetable. At least that much should be written because then you cover yourself. But for us, when you're making a decision of which timetable to follow, I would really suggest that you use 18 degrees. Now, what happens nowadays is when you go on the Internet and you can calculate, you know, you can pick your timetable and you can print it, they ask you what method do you want to use to compute the timetable. They'll say, you know, pick one of five methods. They'll, they'll give you five juristic options. They'll say, do you want to use University of Karachi method? Do you want to use Muslim World League method? Do you want to use Umul Fara method? Do you want to use... Uh, EGA, Egyptian General Authority method, or do you want to use ISNA method? If you select any of them except for ISNA, your fajr time will be the proper fajr time. The beginning fajr uh, time will be the proper fajr time. Now you might ask, well, what about the rest of the months? The rest of the month, it doesn't really matter. It, it, on a practical level, it doesn't matter. Why? Because nobody prays fajr at the very beginning of the time. I mean, in no masjid I know, do they, right when the fajr time begins, call the adhan and start the jama. That doesn't happen. Everybody waits 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, maybe even an hour, and then people come to the masjid and pray the jama'ah. So basically what happens is the issue becomes moot, because once you go 10 minutes into fajr, then according to both timetables, the, the time has started. All right? So be careful about this one issue, and try to, be, try to choose the, um, the safer opinion, because it is the dominant and majority opinion throughout the entire Muslim world. It's not even really a debated issue. So, uh, so be careful about that as far as the timing is concerned. Now, the other thing to remember is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says that you have to continue the fast all the way Continue the fast until the night. Now, in the Islamic calendar or the Islamic timetable, the way you define the beginning of Maghrib is that the upper pole of the sun has to go underneath the horizon. So sometimes, some, when you look at the calculations, of Western, not Islamic timetables, but Western timetables, they sometimes compute sunset as when the middle of the sun hits the horizon. But Islamically, the whole top of the sun has to dip under the horizon, so you have to wait a couple minutes if you use, like, the newspaper calculated Maghrib. But if you use the Islamic um, timetable websites or use one of those things, they usually have taken that into account. But it's something to keep in mind because it's part of the Sharia as well. So that's as far as the timing is concerned. Then the other characteristics, so one thing is what you have to do, which we talked about, and you have to do it within a certain time. We talked about that. 
And then finally, you have to have an intention. So how does that, what does that mean? So remember that the intention is actually in Arabic called a niya. And the niya is an act of the heart. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, um, his ruling was that the niya is an act of the heart. Meaning, you don't have to necessarily verbalize the niya, but in your heart you have to know that you're fasting. So you have to say to yourself while you're getting ready with your, for your suhoor or you're getting up early in the morning, in your heart you know that you're doing this for the, for the sake of fulfilling the fast. But at the same time, it's still mustahab to say it verbally. You don't have to say it verbally. If you know in your heart of hearts that I'm doing all this because I'm fasting, that's fine. But if you verbalize it, it's mustahab. And the way to verbalize it is to say, وَبِسَوْمِ غَلَنْ نَوَيْتُ And if you're in Ramadan, مِنْ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ So, وَبِسَوْمِ غَلَنْ نَوَيْتُ And I intend tomorrow's fast. Okay, that's actually the statement, the, the mustahab statement to use when you make the fast. Uh, sorry, when you make the niya. Now, one of the issues that arises <coughs> is when the niyyah has to be made. Like for each individual fast, when do you actually have to make the niyyah? And that actually depends on the type of fast that you're dealing with. So, <coughs> if you're dealing with, an, with the fast of Ramadan, then the niyyah has to be made for each fast any time between Maghrib and the middle of the next day. So, for example... For today's fast, right? If I want to make a niyyah for this current fast right now, my niyyah, my niyyah time starts at Maghrib yesterday. And any time after Maghrib, I can begin to intend today's fast all the way till about Zawal in the middle of the day. So Zawal time is when the sun reaches its pit peak and it's about maybe noon today. Alright, so about midday you can say. A rough, rough, rough estimate just to, just for the sake of discussion. It's about midday. So any time in that span, I can make a niyyah, right? And even if I just get up and I'm just preparing myself for suhoor or I think about it or I have to fast or anything, that all counts as a niyyah. So it's pretty straightforward. Now, if I want to make up a fast of Ramadan outside of Ramadan, however, in that case, I can make a niyyah from Maghrib, but I have to make the niyyah before the fast begins, right? So... It, basically, there, there's a very general principle that you'll find that, you, or that if you think about it, it'll all come together. If you, may, if you have a fast in the place where it begins, then you can make the niya all the way until the middle of the fast, all the way until midday. What does that mean? Well, if you put a fast where it belongs, for example, the fasting of Ramadan begin, belongs in Ramadan, and the fasting, the nafila fast, the supererogatory fast, belong outside of Ramadan. So if it is a fast of Ramadan, and you're doing it in Ramadan, then you can make the niyyah until the middle of the day. And if it's a supererogatory fast, and you're doing it outside of Ramadan, where it normally should be placed, then you can do it until the middle of the day. And that's why you'll see the Prophet Sallam, there's some famous hadith, where the Prophet Sallam comes at home, and he asks Aisha, Rabbi Allah, Anha, what do we have to eat? It's like noon, it's like lunchtime. What do we have to eat? She says nothing. He says, well, then I'm fasting. All right? So here the Prophet ﷺ is making a niyyah of a supererogatory fast, an extra fast, all the way in the middle of the day, because he, this, that supererogatory fast was where it belonged, meaning outside of Ramadan. So the general principle is that you can fast on any day of the year, year except five, and we talked about those exceptions before. In Ramadan, the fast of Ramadan belong in Ramadan. The supererogatory fast belong outside of Ramadan, so the niyyah for all of those can be made up to the middle of the day. Now, if you take... If you take a fast that doesn't belong in a place and put it in another, that belongs in one place, but you put it into another place, then that niyyah has to be made before the fast begins. So for example, you miss the fast of Ramadan, and you decide that you're going to make up that fast two months later. Now you want to do a Ramadan fast in a place where it doesn't go, right, outside of Ramadan. In that case, you, don't, you cannot make a niyyah until the middle of the day. You have to make a niyyah from the beginning of the fast, all right? So that's the way the niyyah works. Sometimes if you read through books of fiqh, it's very confusing because they keep taking you through every example and they tell you when the niyyah has to be made. But if you just apply this principle, then all of the examples become very easy to understand. So that's what the niyyah, uh, that's, the, that's the basic information that you need to know about the niyyah. The other take-home point that's very interesting is that fasting is one of those unique deeds well, actually, just think about it. The niyyah is the key means by which we reward, right? In the al bin niyyah that verily deeds are rewarded according to their niyyah. So the niyyah becomes the essence of how a deed is rewarded. Now, 
in most cases, you have to constantly check your niya. You have to constantly worry about your niya. You have to constantly worry about why you're doing something because shaitan will attack the niya because that is the heart of every act. For example, if you're praying a loving prayer in the masjid, you're praying, you're not thinking about anything, you just make a niya to do it for Allah. All of a sudden, your best friend walks in the door so you stay in sujood for a couple extra seconds just so he can see you down in sujood. Shaitan destroyed the act. Right? He comes in the middle of the act, he changes your niya, and then he destroys the act. So, what you have to remember is that in so many deeds, the niya is the essence and needs to be protected because shaitan will destroy it at that point. But fasting is unique because there is no way shaitan can destroy your niya. But how are you really going to show off, right? At least in the month of Ramadan, what are you going to do? Stand up here and say, I'm fasting, brothers? Everybody's fasting. It's a good job you're fasting too. You're supposed to be fasting. So the niyyah in Ramadan, that is a very, very easy niyyah to make. And shaitan really can't affect it because everybody's doing it, right? So in the month of Ramadan in particular, obviously outside of Ramadan it's a different story. You want to keep the act hidden whenever you do it. But in Ramadan, the beauty of Ramadan is that all you have to do is withhold from these three things and do it for a certain period of time and the niyyah is not even challenged. That's why that, the act is so rewarded. No, no matter what, there's no way but to do it for Allah. And in fact, that's why Allah says that all the deeds are for Bani Adam, right? All the deeds are for man, except fasting, which is for me. I will reward him myself for fasting. I'm, in fact, in some narrations, I myself am the reward for fasting. So, that's a very interesting point about the niyyah in this particular case. Alright, so that's the end of that discussion on the definition of fasting, the timing of fasting, and the niyyah that's required. The next issue is what breaks the fast. And um, this requires a little bit of understanding. So, if you read through books of fiqh, it's very confusing. Because they list 20 things under the things that don't break the fast. Then they list 20 more things under the thing that breaks the fast. Then they list 20 more things under the things that break the fast and require a kafara. But actually, the principle is very, sim- very simple. So, I'm just going to highlight some principles. And then you'll be able to, inshallah, see how each of the examples um, falls into this line. Okay, first of all, recognize that the definition of fasting is no food, no drink, and, and no intercourse. These are the three things that define fasting. So any of those, if, there, if anything goes down the throat, the question is going to arise, did my fast break or not? Because that's actually the pathway to the stomach. Similarly, it, um, and similarly, intercourse is usually straightforward, but we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. When a fast is broken, there's one of two things that can happen. If you're fasting in the month of Ramadan, and you break that fast, or it gets broken somehow, then in all cases you have to make it up. But if there was an intentional breaking, a, com- a, a complete violation intentionally, so remember this key phrase, a complete violation intentionally, then... What ends up happening is you also have to do something called the kafara. And kafara is a punishment for purposely, completely breaking a fast in Ramadan. Okay, so let's highlight the principles. Now, basically, the general idea is that the question of a broken fast arises when something enters the GI tract or with intercourse. That's when the question is going to arise. Now, what are the paths to the GI tract? The GI tract means the gastrointestinal tract, so you've got an esophagus, the stomach, a small bowel, a large bowel. Okay? Esophagus, stomach, small bowel, colon. You can call it that as well. That entire thing is the GI tract, is the gastrointestinal tract. Now, if something enters into the GI tract, that's when the question of whether the fast is broken or not is going to arise. So first you have to understand what are the pathways to the GI tract. Okay, the three, there's three. Number one, there's the mouth. Number two, there's the nose. And number three, there's the anus, the rectum. That also goes, up, the, the stool comes out of the GI tract through there, right? So that's also connected to the tract. These are the three holes that are present in the human body that connect to that tract. Okay, so that's the first point. Now, as far as the mouth is concerned, the mouth itself is not part of the tract, but you have to actually swallow before the Sharia counts it as entering the tract. For example, if you go and make wudu and you wash your mouth out, the water, the water enters your mouth but we don't call the fast broken, right? Why? Because nothing has gone beyond into the throat, not into the deep throat, you can say. So it really begins at the level of the esophagus, almost at the deep throat. Um, so, that for, so now you have that principle, right? Whatever's in the mouth does not break fast. So therefore, if somebody brushes their teeth, 
Now they're brushing their teeth, brushing their teeth, even with toothpaste. And they begin to um, pick the toothpaste out, and they don't let it go down the throat. The fast doesn't break. Okay. Now they, it, it's makuru to brush your teeth because you still are putting, you know, this scented thing into your mouth and brushing it, and you're risking swallowing it. So it's disliked, but it doesn't break the fast. That's, so that's one example. Similarly, if you taste something, it doesn't break the fast. Technically. So let's say that you're cooking and you're wondering whether there's salt, low salt or high salt in the food. So you dip your finger into the food, you put it on your tongue, that technically does not break the fast. It's highly disliked. It's makuru. You're not supposed to do so. But on a technical legal level, it doesn't break the fast. And in fact, um, um, there's, a, there's a famous example within the books of Fiqh that if there's a woman who has a small child and that child won't eat the food unless she chews it. But, you know, sometimes we, there are children, they won't eat food until it's chewed first. Um, so what happens is the woman needs to chew the food in order for her child to eat it so she can soften it. And there's no other way around it except that she chew it. In that particular case, she is permitted to chew it and to give it to the child. Okay? Because she's not swallowing anything. But for anyone else to do so without an excuse would be highly disliked. Dislike. Makru tahrimi, basically. All right. So that's the example of the mouth. Now, there are some other things to consider as far as pathways that exist in the body that don't connect to the GI tract. For example, the eyes. Okay, the eyes do not connect to the GI tract. So if somebody takes makeup and puts it on, like eyeliner, that does not break the fast because it, nothing's gone into the GI tract. Okay, the other pathway to keep in mind is the urethra. The urethra is the name of that pathway by which urine comes out from the body. All right, so somebody, that does not connect to the GI tract. So if somebody puts water into the urethra or if somebody puts medicine into the urethra, that will not break the fast because that doesn't connect to the GI tract. All right. Also, recognize that the skin has these small pores within it and those pores also don't break, uh, do not attach to the GI tract, so they don't break the fast. Now, if you take lotion or even if you take oil and put it in your scalp, it gets absorbed. It disappears eventually. If you put lotion on the hand, it gets absorbed into the skin, right? But those porous holes on the skin do not connect to the GI tract. So even though the substance is going into the body, if you put lotion, if you put oil on your hair, or you put lotion on your hands, etc., or you put medicine on your hands, that will not break the fast. All right. Then the next thing is what about the ear? Right. So there's a hole. Right. That's the ear. And the question is, does the ear connect to the GI tract or not? Here, there's some debate. The scholars, the scholars of the dean, they felt that the ear does connect to the GI tract because there's something called the eustachian tube. The eustachian tube goes from the ear into the back of the throat to equalize pressure between the, uh, between the ear and, the, and the, the, the rest of the atmosphere. So <coughs> the ulama, the classical ulama traditionally, when they would analyze this issue, they would count the ear as part of the tract. So they would say that if you put ear drops into your ear, that breaks the fast, all right? Now, ENT specialists in this day and age, they say that the ear does not connect to the GI tract. And some ulama, um, some very famous ulama, have basically said, look, this is a matter of medicine. Whether that connects or not is a matter of medicine, so we should leave it up to the medical professionals. Anyway, the fatwa, however, is that the ear does connect to the tract. So the safety lies in not putting anything into the ear, deep into the ear, like eardrops or something, during the fast. Otherwise, so it's, it's actually the fatwa is that your fast will break if you do so. All right, now there are some artific artificial pathways that can also be created. For example, if I take a needle and inject, put an injection into my muscle here, that needle creates a hole, right? But that hole does not connect to the GI tract. It goes straight into the muscle. So therefore, it won't break the fast. Similarly, if I take an IV and I stick it into my vein, even if I grind up, you know, if I grind up rice or something and I put it through the IV into my vein, it has not entered the GI tract. It's entering through an artificial hole and so therefore it does not break the fast. All right? So those things like an IV, like a, an injection, those things are not going to break the fast. Um, one hole that would be an exception, one injection would be an, that would be an exception is like if you get an injection straight into the stomach. So if somebody were to inject into the stomach, 
and inject in something into the stomach, that would obviously enter the GI tract, and that would break the fast. So that's the general principles, and if you keep those, so that's the, that, and if you keep those in mind, it'll help you to understand what's to come. So that's the first question, right? The, did something enter the GI tract or not, and what is the GI tract? All right. Now the next question you have to ask yourself: once something goes into the GI tract, is what entered? What was the substance that entered? It has to be a visible substance, and it has to have a physical form before you will count it as breaking your fast, or before even the question will arise. What we mean by physical form is that you can see the substance with your eyes. So let's say that there's a brother. He uh, puts some beautiful fragrance in the carpet, and we all sit and we begin to smell that fragrance, right? Now, as we're smelling that fragrance, there are molecules that are entering into the nose and going down our throat. Actually, that's how what you smell. You smell those molecules. But because there is no visible, visible form to it, it doesn't break the fast. Okay, so, so the sharia does not get molecular in this regard. But instead, let's say that there was like somebody lit this yesterday actually while the fast was going on. And there was smoke coming from it and they were carrying it and I was just watching it making, and wondering like, I hope nobody breathes this in. Because if there's smoke, visible smoke rising, and you sit there and start sniffing it, then that visible smoke goes into, into your oral pharynx, well, those molecules are going to go down the throat, and that's going to break the fast because it's visible smoke. Similarly, if someone takes a cigarette and begins to, begins to smoke it, there is visible smoke there. If that goes down the throat, I mean, when they smoke it, that's going to go down the throat, and so those particles of smoke will also break the fast. So that's the, first, so that's the thing to remember, that it has to be a visible substance. <coughs> Number two, it has to be... Now, if it's visible, then... It has, if it's uncontrollable, it won't break the fast. For example, you're sitting here, all of a sudden this fly comes flying around and goes right up your nose, or goes right down your throat. And, it, and you're trying to cough it up, you can feel it back there, it goes down the throat. You have no control over that. Although that is a substance, you have no control, it goes down your throat. Similarly, you're driving and there's construction going on on the highway, all these people are, you know, are grinding away at the road and all this dust flies up, and you start breathing it in and you can clearly see that it's dust, you have no control over that. That doesn't break the fast. Similarly, if you had no control over ejaculation, like, for example, somebody was sleeping, right? All of a sudden, when they were sleeping, they had a dream which resulted in, um, which resulted in discharge. That would not break the fast, okay? Because they have no control over it. So in that particular case, that does not break the fast. Okay, once something that is, once something we get, we take out the things that are not controllable, and we talk about the things that have substance, then the next question is, if, if that goes down the throat, what was the person thinking? So now a substance goes down the person's throat, then the next question we're going to ask them is, what were you thinking? Right? Meaning, what was your, what was going on in your mind at that time? If they tell you, oh, I had breakfast and I totally forgot. I totally forgot I was fasting. In fact, the fast was not even in my mind. I just ate, and then after I finished eating, I said, oh, it's 7 o'clock, I was supposed to be fasting. In that particular case, it does not, that, all that eating does not break the fast. Now, if you think about it rationally, it should break the fast. But because the Prophet of Allah provided some guidance on this issue, reason goes out the window, and the Sharia takes control of the issue. All right, so in this particular case, there's a book, from, there's a hadith from Imam Abu Huraira, radiallahu an, in the book of Imam Bukhari, where a man came and he had this exact situation. He ate while he was fasting, but he had totally forgotten that he was in a state of fasting. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that, فَإِنَّمَا أَطْعَمَهُ اللَّهُ وَسَقَاهُ Verily, Allah made him eat and Allah provided him drink, so therefore his fast does not break. So in that case, if you totally, absolutely in your mind don't even remember the fast, no matter what goes down the throat, the fast does not break. Even if the person has relations with his wife, the fast does not break. Okay, so that's that. That's one scenario. The next scenario is that the person recognized that he was fasting, and then this occurred. So in the back of his mind, he's thinking that he's fasting, um, and then this occurs. In that particular case, the fast breaks, right? If it was accidental or if it was necessary, then the fast breaks and there's no kafara. Kafara means the punishment, of, the, the punishment of having to make up 60 fasts in a row, which we'll talk about in a minute for those people who violate Ramadan. So let's, let me give you an example. There's a man, he's sitting doing wudu. As he's doing wudu, he's gargling the back of his throat, and all of a sudden 
he he's thinking about his fast, being very careful. He's saying, I better not do too much of this gargling stuff because maybe water will go down my throat. And all of a sudden, he coughs and some water goes down his throat. Now he's actively thinking about the fast. Even though he did not intend to put water down the throat, because in his mind he knew he was fasting, and he violated the principle of not allowing anything to go down the throat, his fast breaks. But because it was accidental, there will be no kafara on him. All right, similarly, let's say that there is a asthmatic, right? There's an asthmatic. The asthmatic is sitting in the masjid. The cat runs by. All of a sudden, they start having an acute attack. They can't breathe. Now, technically, the inhaler, if you squeeze an inhaler, you'll see this jet of white particles come out, right? Because there's medicine mixed into that inhaler, and it has substance to it. So that inhaler breaks the fast. But now this person is acutely can't breathe and needs to take that inhaler. In that particular case, they have no choice. They have to protect themselves. So they go ahead and they take the inhaler. It broke their fast because they're thinking, what am I going to do? I'm fasting. Here's my inhaler and stuff. They broke their fast, but there's no kafada. They don't have to be punished by making up 60 fasts in a row. All right? Similarly, there's a woman. She's fasting. All of a sudden, in the middle of her fast, she enters her monthly cycle. Now her fast broke because she's not allowed to fast when she's in her monthly cycle. In that particular case, the fast breaks, but there's no kafada upon her. There is no punishment upon her beyond that. She'll have to make up one fast later on. Now, if the, in the third scenario, is that a person purposely breaks the fast. They just, they just purposely say, I, I can't take it, I just don't feel like fasting, I really like that donut on the table. Right? So I just need to have that donut. Is there a car blocking? There's a black Honda that's by the uh, by the garbage cans. If you can just move it, because I think that you can just move it because the garbage uh, people will come to pick up the, the trash. So anyway, so now the third scenario is that there's a person that's fasting and they purposely break their fast, right? Now, if they purposely break a fast of Ramadan within Ramadan, so a Ramadan fast being fasted in the month of Ramadan, then the next question will be, was their violation complete or incomplete? Okay, what is a complete violation? Intercourse, eating, or drinking? Eating, eating, eating of, um, like an edible substance, or a medicine, or intercourse. That's a complete violation. So they completely broke the fast of Ramadan in Ramadan, then there's kafara. But if the violation was incomplete, in the month of Ramadan there's no kafara. What's an incomplete violation? Incomplete violation is the person is really hungry. He's thinking, ooh, look at that donut. I really want that donut. He sees a cockroach crossing and he says, let me just put this in my mouth and eat it instead. Now, a cockroach is not food, right? Or he collects a bunch of flies together and he eats those flies. That's not food, right? So that, doesn't, that breaks the fast because something entered and he purposely did it. But there's no kafara because the violation is incomplete. He didn't get true food. Or he's sitting and he says, ooh, I'm just going to eat this paper, right? He's <laughs> chewing paper and he just decides to eat the paper. <laughs> Right? All of a sudden, he, I mean, these things are foolish, but they exist. You know, things happen like this. So then in that particular case, I just want to highlight the principle. The point is it's an incomplete violation. It wasn't a food item. It wasn't a medicinal item. So therefore, the violation is incomplete. His fast breaks, he, but he doesn't have to give kafara. Okay, but one, com one example that people could raise in their mind that actually is an example of this is if somebody causes themselves to discharge fluid, right, the sexual fluid. In that particular case, now what's prohibited in the fast is intercourse, right? So if a person breaks their fast, let's say there's a person, they break their fast by discharging that fluid, that's an incomplete violation. Because the actual complete violation is intercourse. So therefore that incomplete violation results in a breaking of the fast but no kafara. So they don't owe 60 fasts as a punishment, they only break their fast. So this is uh, where you have to also remember this principle. Now if the fast had, was not a Ramadan fast, or if the fast was outside of Ramadan, then if you break it, you only have to make up that fast itself. So, for example, you decide that you're going to fast on Monday because Monday is a sunnah, and all of a sudden you get invited to, your, your mom calls you, and she says, I want you to come home, uh, come home for lunch, and you know she put a lot of time into cooking it, or you know she's going to freak out if she finds out you're fasting. So, in that particular case, you know, it's 10 in the morning, you go ahead and break it, and then you have to make that fast up, though. Anytime you break an afila, it becomes mandatory on you to make it up later. So that's just an example of break, purposely breaking the fast, even if you use food outside of Ramadan, in which case you do not have to, um, you do not have any kafara, but you do have to make it up. 
Okay, so what are, so now let's go through the list. Those are the principles. What are the actions that do not break the fast? Okay, so if there is anything out of forgetfulness, like somebody ate, somebody drank, somebody had relations with their wives, but they totally forgot about the fast, it doesn't break the fast. If fly or dust or smoke, um, you know, enters the throat unintentionally, like there's a fire and a little bit of smoke comes and enters the throat unintentionally, it doesn't break the fast. If you swallow your own saliva, it doesn't break the fast. Some people just collect the saliva and keep spitting all day. Right? That doesn't break the fast, your own saliva. If you smell an odor, but you don't take in any of its physical property, like somebody spread some kind of itha, and you smell it, that doesn't break the fast. If you swallow, if there's something stuck between your teeth, and it's smaller than the size of a chickpea, and you're sitting and picking it, and all of a sudden it goes down your, goes down your throat, that doesn't break the fast, if it's smaller than a chickpea. If unintended discharge of uh, sexual fluid occurs while you're sleeping, right? If you, it wasn't done by the person, but they were sleeping and it came out, that doesn't break the fast. If anything's injected into the muscles or oil put into the head, or a person donates blood, or a person gets an IV, or a person hugs his wife, or a person kisses his wife on the cheek, right? That does not break the fast. Um, if, if water enters the ears, like somebody takes a shower and water enters the ears, that does not break the fast. If somebody takes a bath to keep themselves cool, that does not break the fast. If somebody uses miswak, that does not break the fast. Toothpaste is makuru, the miswak itself, it's completely fine. All right? And being in a state of impurity after dawn does not break the fast. So, for example, you wake up in a state of janava, right, and it's already the fast has started. So now you ask yourself, wait a minute, I woke up in an impure state, and the fast began, and I woke up uh, half an hour late. I, I, I missed suhur, but I'm impure. Did my fast, does my fa can I fast like this or not? Yes. So you can fast in that type of impure state, and you'll have to take, obviously, a ghusl in order to pray fajr, but as far as the fast is concerned, <coughs> that's not a problem. So those are the actions that do not break the fast. Then there are some acts that are makruh. They don't break the fast, but they're highly disliked. To take something purposely without swallowing it. That doesn't break the fast, but it's makruh. To overdo istinja, that's very important. You know, istinja means to clean yourself after you use the washroom. So if you use the washroom and then you're cleaning yourself, you have to be careful that you don't put water into the rectum because that rectum is part of the GI tract. So you have to be careful that you don't stick water up there. Because an enema, for example, let's say that somebody has really bad constipation or, or you, have, <coughs> you put some sort of medicine in an enema, and you put it up into that sphincter, that breaks the fast, because that's entered the GI tract, all right? So similarly, <coughs> um, overdoing gargling and washing during wudu, that's also disliked. Um, to purposely collect a bunch of saliva in your mouth, and then say, okay, now I'm going to sip it all up, and then sip it down in order to stop my, in order to break my thirst, that's disliked, but it doesn't break the fast. It's very disliked to complain of hunger and thirst. Actually, the fasting is a blessing. blessing. We should be thankful that Allah has allowed us to undergo this difficulty and give so much reward for such a little trial and test, right? So if we should never complain about the fasting, never ever. It's highly disliked. And similarly, to quarrel with one another, to fight with people, to argue with people while you're in a state of fasting is highly disliked. It's totally contrary to the essence of fasting. Anyway, those are some of the makru acts that don't break the fast, but, uh, but, uh, but are disliked. So if you come and you say, my mother started yelling at me. I yelled back at her. My did my fast count. Yeah, your fast your fast counted. Although it was just fine. All right, there are some things that occur which require a makeup only with no kafara. So I've mentioned those. I'll just quickly put them in a list now. Those things will either be necessary or accidental. For example, if you're sitting, a cat walks by you in the masjid. You start having an acute asthma attack. You take your inhaler. That's necessary. It breaks your fast, but there's no kafara. Woman starts menstruating. That's obviously she was imposed upon her from her from from and it was out of her control. So therefore, that breaks the fast, but there's no kafara. If it's accidental, you go into the bathroom, you're making wudu, you're gargling along, and all of a sudden, somebody bumps you, you swallow the water, right? Okay, so that's going to break your fast. It was accidental, there's no kafara. Um, if you mistakenly eat, right, your watch breaks, and all of a sudden, you think it's uh, 5 o'clock, and it's really 7 o'clock, and you're eating away, all of a sudden, you're, you look at another clock, and you see that it's 7 o'clock, then your fast, is, your fast breaks, because you violated the time period, but there's no kafara. Um, so th that's some examples. Um, and also remember that incomplete violations break the fast, but there's no kafara. So if you swallow something that's non-edible, non-medicinal, you swallow a fingernail, right, or like you're biting away at your nail and all of a sudden it goes down your throat, that breaks the fast, no kafara. Um, similarly, 
if there is uh, ejaculation due to a person pur purposely doing that to himself, that breaks the fast, but there's no kafara because that's an incomplete violation. Intercourse did not occur. So those are just some examples of that. Breaking of a nafil fast, that, like an optional fast, like uh, on a Monday or a Thursday, that breaks the fast, there's no kafara. Finally, there are some acts that break the fast and also require a kafara. So those acts include to deliberately eat, drink, or have relations, even without ejaculation, all right? That basically breaks the fast. If you smoke a cigarette, that breaks the fast purposely, and, that, and there is kafara. Um, now, what do we mean by kafara? Kafara means the punishment that you have to undergo in order to make up for violating a fast of Ramadan. <coughs> the first way by which you perform the kafara is to free a slave. Now, obviously, in this day and age, there, is, there are no slaves, right? So you're not going to be able to find a slave to free, but this was the way the Sharia was designed. Much, much before all of this movement of civil rights and all these things that people proclaimed were so great to have occurred in the history of this nation, this was already present within the deen. We were already freeing slaves as part of so many aspects of the deen. The Prophet Shalom highly encouraged it. It was considered a great act of worship to do so. And any time a person made a mistake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would also require them to do that. So in this particular case, if you intentionally broke a fast, the punishment would be to free one slave. But if that's not an option, the next thing that you have to do is to fast 60 days in a row. And that is the next option. I and mean, that's what you're supposed to do. So you have to fast 60 straight days in a row if you break one fast of Ramadan purposely. Now that 60 days in a row um, cannot be broken whatsoever. If you get sick in the middle, you fasted 55 days, you get sick, and you don't fast the 56th day, you start all the way back from one. All right? The only exception is like a woman who enters her menstrual cycle or gives birth to a baby, in which case she enters into like Hayd or Nifas. Hayd means menstruation, Nifas means bleeding after childbirth. So in that particular case, if she fasted 55, or let's say she fasted 30, enters her menstrual cycle for six days and then becomes pure, then she has to continue fasting after the cycle and she can start with the 31st fast. That's the, that's the exception. If for some reason <coughs> you're absolutely, because of sickness or some valid reason, not able to feed 60 people, then you have a choice of doing one of four things. Number one, you can feed 60 poor people with a, to fill their stomach for two meals. So you give them food for two meals and fill their stomach completely, for example, by inviting them to your home. If you can't do that, then what you'll do is you'll feed one person two meals for 60 days, two full meals for 60 days. That also works. If you can't do that, then you'll give 60 poor people 1.6 kilograms of wheat each or it's cash, cash, cash equivalent. So in this particular case, <coughs> you broke a fast and you need to feed 60 people. So what you do is you give 60 different people 1.6 kilograms of wheat or the cash equivalent. So about, let's say, $5 roughly. You have to calculate that if that were to occur, but it's roughly about $5. Finally, the other way to do it is to give one poor person um, 3.5 pounds, which, uh, is about, um, which is about 1.6 kilograms, again, of wheat, um, for 60 days in a row. So you give them that for 60 days independently. That would also fulfill the kafara. So that kafara is actually occurs when you purposely, completely violate a fast of Ramadan in the month of Ramadan. So if you're making up a fast of Ramadan and then you purposely go and eat something, that's not going to require a kafara. So remember the principle. It's a fast of Ramadan. It's a purposely broken fast of Ramadan and it has to be broken in a complete way, meaning it has to be food, medicine, or true intercourse. Those are the three things that will require a kafar. Anyway, that's some of the basic fic about uh, the fast itself. The next section, which we're not going to cover now, deals with the various acts that are sunnah during the month of Ramadan and, and um, are sunnah for the fast itself. So we'll continue on with that, inshallah, the next time, either after Isha tonight or after Fajr tomorrow, depending on how the schedule works out. Um, but basically we'll stop here. Again, the standard announcement that I make is that um, the Prophet Sallallahu told us in the Sahih Hadith that any time a person sit, uh, prays the Fajr prayer and then subsequently remains in their place remembering Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and then after, until the sun rises, and after the sun rises they perform two rakah of Salah they receive the reward of a Hajj and an Umrah. And I've been repeating this announcement every single morning. So, <coughs> obviously we prayed the Fajr prayer in Jama'ah and then we subsequently sat here in the remembrance of Allah, because this is the study of fiqh, which is actually the study of the Qur'an and the hadith in a practical manner.
So all of this basically is a type of zikr, it's a type of remembrance. And now we've come to the point where we're beyond the time when the sun has risen. Um, so basically this is your opportunity to take advantage of that window. Right? There's an incredible reward available. You simply have to stand up, don't talk to anybody, don't do anything, just pray those two rakah, and then inshallah you'll receive that reward. When the Prophet says promises the reward of the Hajj and Umrah, the reward is a complete reward. So it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly into your account. So take advantage of this in these days, especially when we tend to be, our, our hearts tend to be softer and our obedience tends to be more complete. Who knows outside of the month of Ramadan whether we'll get the opportunity to sit for such a long period of time. We're busy, we pray Fajr, we rush off to work. Things change a lot once the, ske- once the schedule ends. So these few days, these last few days, when these last moments exist, to just take advantage of the maximum treasure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us, we should really use it to the best of our ability. So please, first, before you do anything, if you have wudu, if you need to go make wudu, go make wudu and come back. But if you have wudu, just stand up, make the niyyah that you're offering the ishraq prayer. That's called the ishraq prayer. Or just make the niyyah that, you know, think about this hadith that I just said and make the niyyah accordingly. And then go ahead and pray that prayer and then do whatever else you have to do afterwards. Um, and again, the standard schedule, we go all the way, we're, this is now free time all the way up until the Zohar prayer. Um, and then after the Zohar prayer is again free time for ibadah all the way until the Asr prayer. Wa akhirat da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.